many years of going into the correctional facilities. I would often ask diverse groups of people, I'd often ask them if they understood that God had actually probably used the circumstance of their mistakes and of their life to bring them into the prison. And that doesn't mean that God just brought them into the prison, but that then he put something in their heart that they'd want to hear and be changed. And I would always ask the question, because I thought it, it applied mostly to these people who were incarcerated. Was this what you planned for your life? Was this what you dreamed of? Now, 99% of the, the people who I would ask, was this part of your dream, ending up in prison? 99% of them would say no. There'd always be the 1% one, 1 that maybe already flew over the nest. Uh, but 99% would absolutely not. That wasn't part of the equation. And yet, it is exactly what God used to begin accomplishing his plan and purpose in their life. Now, I find it interesting because I have a Scott translation of a passage out of Jeremiah where Jeremiah is saying, it's the Lord speaking through Jeremiah, saying, essentially, I have plans that I've planned for you that you don't know about. They're plans of shalom, they're plans of well-being, of wholeness, of peace, and not of harm, to give you a future hope. King James reads, I, I plan plans for you, even if you want to leave it like that. And all I'd say is oftentimes we forget that God does have a plan for us. God actually, it may not look like it while we're in the midst of things, but this may be part of his plan. And don't think that God is a one plan kind of God, because we mess up the plan. God is perpetually giving us other doors to walk through to further and carry out his plan. A lot of times, and I don't need to see hands because I know we've all done this, in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of circumstance, we will think this cannot be part of God's plan. Now, some of you might be saying, well, my life doesn't look like God's plan very much today. But the scripture clearly says, if you commit your way to the Lord, he goes to work. And if you commit your way to the Lord, maybe in the middle of a mess you created or a mess you haven't created, but you're the recipient of the disaster, but you commit your way. And supposedly, if you believe this, the Lord goes to work. And then again, in that very same Psalm 37, the steps of a good man or woman are ordered to the Lord. So, don't say, well, I have to qualify for God to order my steps. He may be in the middle of your mess ordering your steps. You don't think for a minute that God would just remove the messes to create dreamland for you in the now. <laughs> now, if you believe that about God, you're probably in the wrong church. But I would like us to look at one man's uh, record in the Word um, because I really think it it's so helpful, not only for us to see his life unfold, but to glean something of where his strength came from, to glean something of, we might say, well, that's him and that's not me. No, all scripture is given to help us, to instruct, to teach, for us to take to ourselves. Now, the person we're going to look at, we've looked at many times here. I want today's look to be somber. Most of the time it has some joking, jovial aspects, but I want this to be a somber look. So please, if you will, open your Bibles to uh, Genesis 37. The man we're looking at is Joseph. And the reason why I said let's, let's take another look down this pathway is um, I began really searching my heart about this. You know how many times I've said to you, you read Scripture and it doesn't really hit you right then and there because this may not be your need. This kind of rang home with me as I'm reading this. The first thing that dawned on me is we're in, there are 50 chapters in Genesis. He's introduced in full in chapter 37. 
encountered, obviously, 17 years earlier, because when we meet, meet him here in chapter 37, he's 17 years old. But one quarter, one quarter of the book of Genesis is devoted to him. I want you to juxtapose that with how much time God spent telling us about creation and Adam before the fall. And that'll tell you there's something very important for us to pay attention to. One quarter of the book of Genesis, approximately, devoted to Joseph. And if you took Joseph's life out of these pages, you would be hard-pressed to really understand the book of Exodus. It really does function as a bridge for us to understand how the people came to be where they were, although it was prophesied years earlier to Abraham about the people going in and 430 years coming out. Without the life of Joseph and his chronicles, we'd be hard-pressed to understand at least the opening passages of Exodus. So um, I want kind of to put this together in a tapestry. Um, first of all, I have delivered many sermons on Joseph. Dr. Scott did. There's been books and commentaries galore. And I think every time we've gone down this, this path, I think it's always been um, somewhat, as I said, jovial. Uh, there's a tone on it. We like to paint Joseph a certain way. But I, I'd ask you to kind of run back with me for a little bit and, and see the full tapestry. And maybe a somber look is, is, is what we need to see to really recognize the greatness of this, this man's story, his life story. Unlike other people in Genesis, God did not appear to Joseph. I love the fact that if you chronicle Abraham's life, the Lord appeared to him seven times. If you chronicle Isaac, I believe it's twice that the Lord appeared, and to Jacob five times, not to Joseph. Now, don't go counting his dreams. That's something else. Did not appear to him. And what's interesting, see, I always bring all of these diverse strings, if you will, that comprise and make up the tapestry. I always pull them probably from the back. So sometimes you, you're left looking with me at the back side of the tapestry and saying, what's going on here as I'm weaving this for you? But I often think of when Dr. Scott used to tell about Pop Scott and Pop Scott having his vision and telling about his vision. And Dr. Scott used to lament and say, well, I've never had a vision. And I, I think to myself, this is a great example here. Who says we have to have visions? Who says that we have to uh, have some uh, grand experience that's so, I mean, I'm, I'm glad when we have Pop Scott's testimony and we play it and he tells the story and that's wonderful. But many of us have not had those experiences. And I love the fact that Joseph didn't either. Kind of makes me feel like, okay, there's somebody in the Bible I can identify with on that level. There's other people for other things, but on this particular level, he didn't have encounters with God like the others did. And if you trace back his life, I love this. Right here we encounter him at 17 years old, but way back there we find his father, Jacob, working for Laban. He had his eyes on that beautiful woman, Rachel, couldn't wait to marry her. And you know the story, Laban tricks Jacob, uh, Laban's daughters, Rachel and Leah, Leah being the older ugly one. Uh, he's tricked, Jacob is tricked into marrying the older ugly one. He worked seven years for that. What's that song? Wasted years. Yeah. <laughs> Seven years to get the ugly one, but he still wanted Rachel. So he worked another seven years to get her. And during those years, we have a lot of productivity on the part of Leah. Uh, in one chapter of Genesis, she's basically, well, she births half the tribes of Israel. Uh, <laughs> But Rachel's womb was barren. She could not bear children at that time. And we have the record of her giving her a handmaid to Jacob. And we don't hear Jacob saying, oh, no, I can't because I love you. He goes in there and with Rachel's handmaid, he produces some children. Finally, God opens up Rachel's womb. She bears a child named Joseph. So we have Leah's firstborn, Reuben. 
He forfeits his position technically as the firstborn because of other incidents. That's another sidebar. But we know in the heart of Jacob, he will always look upon that child, Joseph, the firstborn of Rachel, his lovely, beloved wife, as his favorite son. We know this. Now, I'm taking you back behind this Genesis 37. And what we have is something that I think we don't often think about. Could the child Joseph, who we're talking about now, could he have been old enough at the time that when Jacob decided, I've had enough of Laban deceiving me and robbing me and cheating me, I'm taking my wives and their handmaids and all my children. One has not been born yet. That's Benjamin, the last one, has not been born yet. But I'm taking all these and all my possessions, and we're out of here. They're fleeing, running for their lives. They've got to get away from Laban. I'm thinking, if we count the age of the children being produced, maybe Joseph could have been, possibly, could have been about five years old. I'm thinking that possibly, it's possible for a five-year-old to have some memories of certain things that have happened that are those landmark events in our life. I, I don't know if while they were fleeing and at some point they settled down, the panic and the terror being announced that Esau, Jacob's brother, is coming with 400 men marching. He thinks with impending doom to come and get revenge on him. I wonder if all the children are there, but I'm wondering if Joseph could have understood that. Or better yet, while all the wives and children and all the possessions are sent across the Jabbok to the other side while Jacob wrestles with the angel of the Lord, I'm wondering if in the morning when the sun came up and Jacob had been touched by that angel, crippled, and his name was changed to Israel, he walked with a limp now, remembering who he formerly was, name being changed. I wonder if the children and the wives were on the horizon watching this strange silhouette as the sun came up of, of a man whom they might have recognized, and certainly maybe the children as their father, and the wives, that's their husband, but something different. I wonder if this child, Joseph, could remember that. Uh, there are so many pictures here, and I think to myself, it's possible. I have an image I've painted in my mind. I see Jacob, Israel, and the young child, Joseph, holding on to daddy's long coat while Jacob, Israel, points to the place at Bethel where he dreamed the dream and the ladder from heaven to earth appeared. I see a young child that would look up into his father's eyes, Joseph, and Jacob, Israel, looking into his child's eyes and Israel seeing the, the features, the traits of his beloved wife, Rachel. I think all of these things, you, you almost have to put it all underneath to get a good picture of what this child went through. We often talk about death and dying. These didn't have the promise we have. So this first encounter for these children, and I'm now really focusing in on Joseph, was the death of Deborah, the nurse of Rebecca. That was Jacob's father, Isaac, his wife, their nurse. Some vestigial remnant to their past, she dies. I'm sure that was the child's first exposure to death, and they bury her beneath an oak tree. And then next in that line of tragedies, Joseph's own mother. They are in transit in a large caravan, and we have this picture. It's not a very far dis distance. They're going from Bethel to Ephrath, and here she is in hard labor about to give birth to Benjamin. Hard labor and she brings forth a son, but she dies in the process. And Joseph, the child, that's his mother, has to look on. His mother is dead. They bury her. They bury Rachel in a place, if you'll envision, that years later, Ruth would meet Boaz, and years later, a young child named David would, future king of Israel, would tend sheep. They buried her there. And at a later time in Joseph's life, he will return there to bury his father. Now, I ask just to take a brief pause here, because we have a lot of people who have been touched by death. 
at some point, and especially you young people. And I put the emphasis on the youth here for a reason. This is a good example that we can be exposed to life's tragedies, and we don't have to conform to what is normally labeled what must happen. Something happens in our family. We're not to be Stoics, but rather, Joseph gives me an idea that it's possible for us to raise our children, to raise children in the church and you in your home, understanding that death is a part of living, understanding that, yes, the flesh hurts, but I look on and I see this child as the most beautiful example of never deviating from the path of faith. I'm not saying he was perfect. I'm just saying he never deviated from the path of faith and exposed to much tragedy in his early years. Now we have a picture of him in Genesis 37, and we're about to encounter something strange. I say strange because of all the pictures that could be painted, we're, we might be very quick to read over this particular image here. Genesis 37 begins with, and Jacob. I'd have you note that is a very strange thing. Why? After all, Jacob's name has been changed to Israel. Why does it begin with, and Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger? We might come back to that. It's just these little things that we just raise right over and we never stop to pay attention. So God's always usually saying something because the name Jacob, as you know, means heel catcher, conniver, deceiver. So there's still something here that God might be telegraphing to us through using that name. Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Now, pause right there. With all the history I've given you, I would like you to note that Joseph had the least amount of exposure to old Jacob. He had more exposure to the man he would have connected with and bonded with would have been the crippled Israel. But all of these sons would have had more time and more exposure to the old Jacob way. And I believe the Lord lets these little pieces of tapestry be uh, put in here ever so nicely um, just to kind of make us remember that these children... These children out here that are being referred to are the children of servant women. We mentioned Bilhah and Zilpah. These, these are the, the handmaids. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, one might read right over that and say, well, well, we don't know what they were doing. How could it be an evil report? Now, many times we've taught on this and we've said, well, maybe Joseph was like a tattletale, big mouth. But I'd ask you to reconsider how we, how we see him. First of all, we can see that he was devoted to duty. He was doing the work that the father had given to all the sons. You know, when we talk about uh, this particular life passage of Joseph, we often talk about dreams because he dreamed dreams. But back in this biblical page of time, you would not have a child dreaming to, to, they could maybe dream of something else, but their life's vocation and calling would always end up being whatever the father did. Whatever the father's will and whatever the father's work was, the sons, in this case the son, but the sons carried out. So if we're looking at this where it says Joseph brought unto his father their evil report, one might ask, well, what? What exactly were they doing? We'll find out here in uh, another verse or two. But it says, now Israel, we're back to that new name. Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. And I'd ask you to make some notes on this, please. So I had to go back and translate and pick this apart. It made no sense to me seeing that Reuben would only be six years older than Joseph. If, if, Joseph, is 20, is, if Joseph is 17, Reuben is only 23. So how could we be saying that this is the son of his old age when, in fact, there was a lot of them? So it would be better to understand that the Hebrew carries with it an idea, the son of old age really 
sagacity, of wisdom, of maturity. And that was conveyed or communicated to the child. He was very mature for 17. See, I, I think all of us have done this. We've read through and we've kind of painted a picture of a very immature 17-year-old. But in this particular depiction, a very mature 17-year-old. You might say, well, how do you say that? Uh, let's read on a little bit. It says that Israel, jo uh, Jacob, Israel, made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him, could not speak peaceably unto him. There's your, the beginning of understanding their evil report. They were not nice with their brother. They hated him. Now I'll go on to say and elaborate as to the motivation of their hate, but they hated him. Now let's get a right picture for a minute. I want to, I'm going to try and make up a word. I want to de-caricature Joseph today. Because it's a great Sunday school lesson. Many grow up listening and great stories of Joseph's multicolored, wonderful, beautiful patchwork coat of many colors. Let me tell you about the coat of many colors. It's a great caricature, but not accurate. Now, I have scripture to back me up on this. The coat that is talked of here, the very same Hebrew words appear in two places. One of them is, and I have it down here, I want to make sure I quote it right. One of them is, don't turn there, but write it down and you go check it out later. Two, two scriptures I'll give you. One of them is Judges 5.30. And it speaks of... Um, in this particular language, a mark of distinction, a coat of diverse colors with lots of needlework on it as a mark of distinction. But more importantly, the better reference is in 2 Samuel 13, 18. Right before Amnon rapes, rapes Tamar, Tamar comes in to his presence wearing, it is exactly as this, a robe of many colors. And that was the sign, if you'll read 2 Samuel 13, 18, that was the sign, the mark of purity, of honor, and in her case, in Tamar's case, before she was raped, virginity. So it's interesting. We, we make a cartoon characterized, uh, here comes the coat of many colors, and it's, you know, did Jacob sew it together and make patches, and did it look like a, you know, no. It was a finely embroidered, many colored, and most probably uh, the coloring on the edge of the sleeve, on the bottom, maybe some part around the neck. And this is important because the rest of it would have probably been a, a light or white linen. And I say that for a reason. This coat was probably quite long. And this alone would telegraph to his brothers that this type of vesture would not be for someone doing hard labor in the field. You wouldn't wear a long coat like that to do hard labor. You'd, you'd wear a coat like that to be an overseer, to be someone as a person of honor and distinction, standing above and watching the rest of these work. That's what that coat would, to them, would telegraph. But they saw that coat, oh, they hated him even more. Now, all of these are little, it's just small details, but you, you really have to catch the picture of this. Otherwise, it just becomes, as I said, a caricature, and uh, we do what we normally do, which is a lot of it's very funny until you stop and say, wait a minute, it's, it's not funny at all. It's, it's pretty serious. Now, Joseph dreamed a dream. He told it to his brethren. They hated him yet more. So first, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably to him. Here they hate him even more because he dreamed a dream. And I'd have you uh, recall, and if you don't remember, go back and read it later on. I just mentioned it. Jacob, Israel Jacob, dreamed a dream as well. In fact, it, wasn't, it was not an uncommon thing for God to communicate to people in their dreams at night. He did it with Abraham. He did it with Jacob. And now he's doing it again here. He dreamed a dream. He told it to his brethren. They hated him yet more. He said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed, 
Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose. Connect this with that robe. Connect it with a lot of things that have already been said. And also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. His brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Please connect this to what I just told you about that beautiful coat, because that coat of many colors, as we refer to it, is a symbol of something. Israel, Jacob didn't make that willy-nilly, like, oh, I'm just going to make you a nice coat. It was, a, it was symbolic. Are you going to reign over us? Will you have, indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet more for his dreams and for his words. So now they hated him and they couldn't speak nice to him. They hated him because of his dreams. Now let's add one more. Because of his words. And I will tell you something for me that is so radical. Yes, Joseph is about the, the most precise type of Christ we can find in the Old Testament in that we see this beautiful picture of really being hated without a cause. We have this beautiful picture of being hated primarily at the first because the father loved the son. The father, Israel, loved Joseph. I have all these connections. Now, I'm not one that goes off in the deep end where everything is a type and a shadow, but I can't help it as I read through this. I think this is amazing that we would look at this and then just plow right through it. He dreamed yet another dream, told it to his brethren. If you and I were, would, had been ridiculed the first time around, you think we'd go back for more? Behold, I've dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars made obeisance to me. He told it to his father and his brethren. His father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou, that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth. His brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying. Now, I take another bit of notes here. One, we already know that Rachel is already deceased. He may be referring to one of his other wives, but he says, your mother. There's subtle little bullet points to hang some thoughts on, and uh, at, at a later time you might leave here saying, well, that opened a door. That opened another door. I've got more questions. Good. That's what should happen. You should leave here with more questions. Okay, that's my message. No, all right. <laughs> his brethren envied him. His father observed the saying. Now, let me just stop and say this again. Hatred and envy go hand in hand. They're like twins. They like to be together. So this just reads more. And I love the fact that it says, his father observed the saying. Now he took note. There's something, you know, something going on with that kid. I don't know what it is, but there's something going on here. His brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Shechem, if you are going to look up in a dictionary, will be some tra sometimes translated as the neck or the shoulder or the place where the burden is. Might be carried or the place, the location of burden. Israel said unto Joseph, do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Okay, I'll count me and I'll go. No hesitation here. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now, Hebron... In Hebrew, if you look it up in a lexicon or a dictionary, it means place of alliance or fellowship. Again, one of these pictorial things that if you're just reading this in English, you, you'll miss, and it is a type. The father sends the son out of the place of fellowship to the place of burden. And I love all of these beautiful pictures that are so nicely woven into the Hebrew, and then you come to read the English, and you go, yeah. A certain man found him. Behold, he was wandering in the field. The man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? He said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. The man said, They are departed hence. I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. So names always mean something as well. It's no mistake. We know Joseph's name that was given to him by his mother 
means adds, just simply adds, because she said, the Lord's added to me. And later on in Genesis 41, Pharaoh will give him a second name. And that second Egyptian name means revealer of secret things, revealer of secrets. It's kind of ironic that Pharaoh would name him something that he already was before he even met Pharaoh. He goes to Dothan. He finds his brothers there. When they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Uh, again, Hebrew footnote, The master of dreams is coming. The master of dreams is actually the, Baal is the word they use, but the master of dreams is coming. Come now, therefore, let us slay him, cast him into some pit. We'll say, some evil beast hath devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Now, you know, you can, you can fit a bunch of things on top of all this, but I, I focused my energy on the father's love to send out his son. And remember, there's that special bond. That's, that's his special son. Rachel's dead. Father is sending out that special son to go and see about his brethren. And is this not exactly in type what happens when we have Jesus coming to his own, his own received him not? Here we have in type, we have this Joseph appearing, and they can't stand the, the sight of him. Makes them conspire to kill him. Well, isn't that what they did to Jesus? They murmured against him when he said, I'm the bread of life. Oh, boy. So you, you have all these wonderful pictures here of, I think, types. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Remember, Reuben being that firstborn of Leah. Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness. By the way, that's what Dothan means, two cisterns. And by the way, there, that, that pit they threw him in was definitely empty, no water in it even and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him again to his father. It came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many colors. I, I have you note it's italicized in my Bible, maybe in yours too, the many part of colors that was on him. They took him, cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And then they sat down to eat bread. Now, some of this is just absolutely jarring because we can read through this like a, a plow and not stop to think. They just threw the brother in a pit. Now they're going to sit down and eat bread. Come on, let's break bread. Let's just, let's relax now. Very interesting behavior. Um, we seldom paint this picture here, but I'd ask you to indulge me. As they, they sat down, they, they look, lifted up their eyes and looked. Behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm, and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? And here's a real thinker here. He says, Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother and our flesh. We really care about him. It's like those people say, I'm praying for you. <laughs> you know, he's our flesh, he's our brother. Well, yeah, I'll just sell him then. And his brethren were content, evil people. Now, what I, if I go no further today than putting this in place, I want you to see in the bigger picture the father's love for the son and the son who did, at least in this record, did nothing wrong except report his dreams and speak his words was hated without a cause. And yes, there are people that tell you everyone will love you once you become a Christian because they're not reading the same book you and I are reading. This is what Jesus said when he said he came to set a man at variance. Here we have it right here. You could take any part of the New Testament and just in, in these brief passages see how wonderful God is to show us, hey, I, before I sent my son in the flesh, I gave you a beautiful pattern to show you what he might look like along the wave will pay attention. And wonderful, they're, then they're passed by Midianite merchantmen. They drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, sold Joseph 
to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Reuben returned unto the pit. Behold, Joseph was not in the pit and rent his clothes. And he returned unto his brother and said, The child is not. Where'd he go? They took Joseph's coat, killed a kid of the goats, dipped the coat in blood. Of course, they bring it back to the father and they say, uh, That's what's left of your fave right here. He must have been devoured by wild beasts or something, right? Jacob, again, you see, they didn't stick consistently for a reason. Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his loins, mourned for his son many days. Now, all the while, by the way, something that jumped into my mind. We never hear of this. We, we suddenly encounter that uh, Joseph will be in Potiphar's house. There's a whole section of silence that we don't know. And I envision, I, 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 I kind of connect the dots sometimes with imagery. I think, what must have happened when they brought him into Egypt? They had to have some type of an auction going on. He was a 17-year-old, you know, probably in good physical shape. And when they put him up on the block, you can just imagine some of these very jagged, uh, creviced faces staring him over, giving up. We, we never think about that. What it must have been like for the 17-year-old in absolute terror, standing there waiting to be sold. You know, we always picture that when we talk about Hosea and Gomer, but we never see it here. I, I, I brought to my mind, if I could only imagine what it was like, the terror of this young man to be looked at up and down like he was some animal and then sold going to some unknown place. And you might say, well, how did he survive? We know that he ultimately ends up a steward of all in Pharaoh's house, in, in Potiphar's house first. And some events that happened along the way, and I'm getting too far into the story, because my focus is, where was his strength? Where did he get this strength from? And that's why I said about his wisdom and his maturity. Because as we encounter him uh, in the next chapter, we've got to go to chapter 39 to pick up the story. Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. The Lord was with Joseph. I don't want to go any further, because... Most of you know the rest of the story. I don't want to go any further today. I just want to talk about this concept, which at some point, the mind has to wrap around how much do you go through in what God's referencing here as his plan before you turn sour, before you become jaded, before you decide that life has not been too fair to you. Meanwhile, a tender soul is going to look at this and say, this is what God intended me to see. Not the ridicule and the spectacle of some of the things we've said in the past about Joseph and the, the lifestyle and the people around him, but rather what to do when you're fairly, unfairly accused, what to do when disappointment sets in, how to see yourself even in the darkest of places, which, by the way, being in Egypt would not be a piece of cake. And then couple that by the fact that your brothers have abandoned you, falsely accused you, abandoned you, sold you. He started off as a child, a favored child. He ends up, now we have this favored child, special child. Now we have a servant, slave. And I think once again, God has this beautiful capacity to just superimpose scripture. He took upon him the form of a servant. I see Christ in every dimension here, that God was trying to say, while he was yet a prominent person in God's view, he had the lowest standing at some point. After, after some events in Potiphar's house, he's thrown into prison and becomes now a prisoner. Not enough to be just a slave, but he's a prisoner. And you and I need to glean out of this where his strength came from. That's why I just said I'll stop here, because it says, the Lord was with Joseph. Was the Lord with Joseph 
when his brothers threw him in the pit? And the answer is yes. Was the Lord with Joseph when he was sold? The answer is yes. You keep going down this pathway, and you'll figure out that God does let calamities in. They look calamitous to us. They may even feel like calamities. They're, they could be entire messes comprised of one day in your life or mine, but God might be ordering your steps. I took the liberty to make a translation of where I believe, even though I said the Lord was with him. Let me show you. When Jacob, Israel, is going to bless all of his children, he will bless Joseph and speak a word about Joseph, which is in chapter 49. Turn there, and I, I hope to be able to tie all these ends together for you. Chapter 49, and verse, beginning at verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. Let me read verses 23 and 24 as well. The archers have sorely grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow abode in strength. And I stop right there. I don't want to go any further. Let's read it aright, and I'm going to give you um, first the 26th translation. Some of those uh, are actually accurate. When it says, Joseph is a fruitful bow, I don't know why they use that word. I have no idea. Joseph is a fruitful son. In fact, the literal, literal, Ben Perat, Yosef, son, fruitful, adds, he adds. Joseph, fruitful son, by a spring or a fountain, his branches, so let me read here, um, whose branches run over the wall, uh, uh, fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. Let me show you where his strength is. His strength came from an unseen source. That well, that word being translated in your King James by a well, is a fountain or a spring. You could not see the source of his strength because the depths of it went so far into the veins of God, if you will, into the mind of God. We sing the song, there is a fountain speaking of the blood, the shed blood. There's also a fountain spoken of in Isaiah 12, speaking of the fountain of salvation, the wells of salvation, always bringing back to a place and imagery of God being the living waters. So we have here the well, whose branches run over the wall. And I would just have you also to note here in a translation, the fact that there is a wall means there is a boundary or enclosure. That means that Joseph was fruitful, his strength came from some unseen source, which we know is God, which could not be contained or walled up, not in a prison, not in Egypt, not even by Satan. And you talk about invisible forces at work. And that last, it says, the archers have sorely grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. The Hebrew simply says, they hated him, they, they tormented him. The, the archers are speaking primarily of his brethren, and all those that hated him without a cause, including when he said, remember me to the butler, remember me. When you get out of prison, remember me. Who? But his bow abode in strength. Very poor translation. Very, very poor translation. But rather, that source of his strength made him remain, made him steadfast, made him able. And I'm asking you today, before we go any further, I, I, in fact, I really don't want to go any further. I'd like you to look at this as, a, as a, a tapestry for us to not only look at, but then to take comfort from. The minute you do exactly what has been depicted with Joseph, Joseph said, go inquire about your brethren, just like Jesus. Go inquire, seek first, seek and save those that are lost. But he came to his own, by the way, and they would not receive him. We see this imagery of someone who is rejected. Isaiah talks about how he was despised and rejected. And no one likes to preach the message where we, we, we koinonia, we are koinonia, not only in his 
glories, but also in his sufferings. In a small microcosm, Jesus warned his disciples, you ain't going to be like, that was a Scotism. If you love me, you'll probably be hated without a cause. You know, I'm, I, I'm just going to tell you as a congregation, because I, I, this is the way I am, I let it all hang out. When I first stepped on the platform, that was many years ago, I wondered how it could be that I stepped from seemingly the administrative pastor of this church and I think beloved wife of Dr. Scott, uh, maybe annoying to some of the staff people, but how I could be so beloved and so held in such high regard. Oh, we just love you. And the minute I stepped onto the platform to take up the responsibilities given to me, I didn't take over the church and I didn't want to take over the church. Had Dr. Scott said, close up shop and go find a nice beach somewhere, I would have said, yes, sir. <laughs> but the minute I stepped out in the gap, the minute I took that leap of faith, and it was a giant leap of faith for me, people started to turn against me. And I, I, not yet understanding these principles that I stand on firmly today, it tormented me. I could not connect the dots because I really, I do know now when 1 John talks about if any man hates his brother, there's no way you can love God with that much venom and vitriol in you. You just, you just tear down somebody who would step up all for the cause of we're going to hold up the banner and the name of Jesus Christ and keep faith going and keep preaching and proclaiming until it comes again. Is that a cause to be hated? Absolutely. And I smile because I can. And today... I love my enemies. No, 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 no. Let me say that again. I love my enemies. What's so special about loving the people that love you back? But rather, I love my enemies. Why? Because I recognize such overt hatred could only come from people who have rejected the Spirit of Christ, who have rejected the Word of God, who have rejected the concept that Christ came to love the unlovable such as me and such as you, that Christ came to save me and to save you. And in that mindset, how could, you left, how could you be left with a heart full of hate, except it's still a heart full of stone? And that's all. And why I love my enemies? Because now I look at this passage and I say, this is where my strength is. My strength doesn't come from the people around me who are busy throwing the stones. In Jesus' day, in Jesus and our Lord, and I'm just, I'm just a speck of dust. Our Lord, they would have killed him. They would have stoned him. They would have gotten him out of any town. Here I come. I, I have decided to follow Jesus, right? Come on, guys, and we're going to have a hallelujah, good time. Everybody's going to love us now. Right. Wrong. The minute you turn and face and make that step, just as Jacob, Israel, sent Joseph and said, go inquire about your brothers. And he said, here I am and I'll go. Like Jesus, I must be about my father's business. The minute you take that step of following, being led to follow, you are going to have some of the mightiest oppression come against you. Now I know, we've taught on this passage and we've said, Satan... Satan can orchestrate those roadblocks, but you know, the more I read this, the more I think to myself, no, this is one time, and I ask you to do the same. I ask you to look at the facts that I've just presented regarding Joseph, and I ask you to look carefully, because I've heard every, specifically those charismatic nutbags <laughs> who want to say, who want to come to the end of this passage and say what, what Satan intended for evil, God intended for good, and they misquote the whole thing. Sure, Satan will come at the child of God and attack and try and thwart and push you out of the way and try and trap you and trip you up, but this particular passage, I'd have you really think with me for a minute, had certain events which appear to be totally ugh, calamitous had they not appeared exactly the way they did. Could God have made other calamities occur? Sure, he, he can do that. Just think of it, had Reuben come back five minutes earlier, Joseph wouldn't have still been in the pit, and he wouldn't have been sold, and he would have gone back home, 
and given another evil report and said, these rotten, scoundrel children of those other wives, handmaids. What if? And then you start going down this path and start saying, wait a minute, the Lord ordered my steps. I committed my way, even if my way was a mess. In the midst of my mess, see, God doesn't say, go clean up the mess and you can commit your way. In the middle of everything, I committed my way. The scripture says, he'll order my steps, and my steps might take me to unpleasant places along the way. In fact, I really believe oh, the Lord might actually take us into a few dark dungeons before he lets us get out into the bright light. And no matter how you slice it, the beautiful part of this is I see where his strength comes from. I see a man who should have been so bitter, unlike the men that I may go preach to or the women that I may speak to who are incarcerated. This man did no wrong. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? He did no wrong. Falsely accused. How many of us would be able to look at Joseph's pattern and say, well, how I could, I could do that. I could remain genteel. I could remain kind. I could remain tender-hearted. I could let it all go because ultimately, the, at the end of all this, his brothers are going to come back and he's going to reveal himself to be the brother they sold away. And he's not bitter. Now, you tell me a better picture of Christ's likeness in the Old Testament. You tell me a better pathway for me to focus my eyes on. I'm not this man. I fall very far short of uh, that's why I said I identify with other people in the Bible way better. David, in some areas of his life, I really connect with. My point is, Joseph gives me a glimmer of how it's possible because my strength comes from an unseen place. He really does look like that tree planted by the water, that the water source being our Lord and Savior, the life-giving water planted and rooted so deeply that the strength to grow and be strong. And when these dark hours come, I know where my strength comes from. My enemies may still be hurling and may be angry. Well, I thought I'd get under her skin. No, you helped me. You blessed me. You blessed me to understand that there's something infinitely more God wants to carve and chisel away at me to make me more like him. And if it takes that, I know I'm one of his. How many times have I said to you, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he trains. How does he train? Does he say, oh, sit down here and I'll give you a little rub down. Come on, take off, take off your shoes. Put your feet up and give you a little foot massage. No, but rather, it says, Scripture's very plain. If we are not receiving that training or chastening, we're not his children. So the next time you find yourself in a sticky situation, it may be a pit of your own making, it may be a prison of your own doing, whether it's your fault or not, just remember where your strength comes from. God is not asking you to perform a stoic act or to be perfect, but remember where your strength comes from. It's the unseen forces that keep us anchored, and those unseen forces in the, in the Old Testament are pretty clear when you read on. I stopped us at verse 24. The arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. If I could get you and if I could get myself to see that stone of Israel, Jesus Christ, that rock of ages cleft for me, not moving, not persuaded to abandon me, not provoked to anger, against me, but unseen and with me. How great to take some of this today as if I were not really, but in my mind, taking these pages of everything I've just said and putting them in my pocket and saying, the Lord's with me. He is my strength. The roots of my life, they are very deep with him. On the surface, I may look like whatever the world wants me to, they'd like me to be or what they think of me and the enemies and the friends and who cares. It's what, what I am rooted and grounded. That's why the scripture 
New Testament, rooted and grounded in the faith. And I keep coming back to that because that is the anchor of our soul. Not faith in faith, not faith in a man, not faith in a woman, but faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And with that anchor, no matter where you find yourself today, I don't speak of an hour from now, as thy day, today, take comfort. The Lord is with you. He's your source of strength. He's the one that's going to keep you stable. Here come the, the enemies. Here comes the darkness. Here comes the wind. Here's my rock, the stone of Israel. I'm anchored. The roots have taken, and I am standing in him. In Jesus' name, I pray you take this today and know wherever you are, this message should bring comfort to all. Joseph is a type and a pattern of the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, giving us the faith and the courage to make it all the way home. In Jesus' name, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.